When we have discovered, as we have in the late 20th century, that the fundamental entity that makes life work is not just the matter, the energy, the chemistry, it's the information, then, as I've argued, we're looking at evidence for an intelligent agency. How do mathematical equations generate an actual physical universe of matter, space, time, and energy? That's completely unexplained in quantum cosmology. I think what these uh, advocates of quantum cosmology have done is subtly support the very idea they think they're disproving. Because if their theory is true, then it's pre-existing mathematics, which is conceptual and intellectual. It's it, it, They're pointing to the need for a mind prior to the universe to make their whole system work. And so the fine tuning problem doesn't go away. It's just pushed out of view with the multiverse. The, the, the fine tuning is explained by reference to a universe generating, generating mechanism that invokes prior unexplained fine tuning. at the desk. Today in conversation with me is the noted American philosopher of science, Dr. Stephen C. Meyer. Dr. Meyer received his PhD in the philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge. He's a former geophysicist and college professor and currently serves as the director of Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. He's the author of such books as the New York Times bestseller Darwin's Doubt and Times Literary Supplement Book of the Year, signature in the cell. And his latest book is The Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries That Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. It makes a compelling case for the existence of God, arguing from crucial scientific advances in biology, cosmology, and physics. And we will be talking about the book about intelligent design, theistic evolution, the multiverse hypothesis, and more today. Welcome, Dr. Meyer, to the show. Thank you for having me, Asher. So, Dr. Meyer, uh, talking about your most recent book, The Return of the God Hypothesis, um, it goes over and beyond uh, some of your previous writings to actually encompass a few other facets and domains of science to make a case for design. And for a long time, um, the hypothesis of, of God has been snubbed from the sciences. Uh, probably it goes back to Laplace's dogmatic assertion that I don't need that hypothesis. Can you probably unpack the history of science? How did uh, science, which largely originated from a Christian culture and theological background, but eventually what led to the exit of God from the arena, so to speak, and what brings him back? That's a very good question. And you'll see right away that the title of my book invites uh, a story, it invites exactly the story you're asking about, which is um, first that the what we call modern science with its systematic ways of investigating nature first arose in a uh, Judeo-Christian milieu in Western Europe. Um, and scientists or historians of science describe a period they call the scientific revolution. Sometimes that's dated from about 1500 to 1750. Uh, but I think increasingly historians now recognize that the roots of that scientific revolution go back into the late Middle Ages and will date the, the whole of the revolution from, seven, or from 1300 to 1750, something like that. Um, in any case, you have figures like Boyle, Robert Boyle and Sir Isaac Newton and Johannes Kepler, uh, uh, John Ray and many, many others who were first impelled to study nature in a very systematic way. And it turns out as you read their works, you find that the motivation that they had for the kind of study that they were doing was largely theological. Um, I have on my shelf behind me a book by John Ray, The Wisdom of God uh, Manifested in the Works of Creation is his famous title. Uh, he was the founder of uh, what we would call systematics today. Uh, the Linnaean classification system was largely built upon his initial classification of plants and animals. John Ray went on to tutor Isaac Barrow, who uh, proved the first 
theorem of the calculus and then tutored Newton who developed the calculus in its full glory um, and all the other wonderful things Newton did. So Ray was the tutor of Barrow, Barrow was the tutor of Newton and Ray was also in, um, among other things, the the founder of, of British natural theology, the idea that by studying nature, you could see the evidence of the handiwork of God. And all the scientists during this period had a concept that they implicitly employed to give them confidence in studying nature. And the concept was that of intelligibility, the idea that nature could be understood by a rational human mind, by the intellect of human beings, because our minds had been made in the image of the rational creator who built his rationality and design into nature. So there was a principle of correspondence. Uh, as John Polkinghorne, the Cambridge physicist priest of uh, just, a, he just only recently died, used to say, the reason within matches the reason externally, without, in the external world. And so for that reason, we can study nature and hope to perceive its secrets. And there were many other assumptions about the nature of God and the nature of the natural world, the nature of the physical world, that gave these early founders of modern science both an impetus to study nature and confidence that they could do so successfully. And uh, I write about them in, in my book. So there are many historians who now see that, that modern science is actually a kind of um, a child of, of Christianity. and But in the Christianity uh, of course, affirming also the, the Judaic roots of Christian belief. Uh, the book of Job was very important in, to many of the early founders of science in formulating their concepts of the laws of nature, for example. So you have Jew Jewish, a Jewish contribution to this, you have a Catholic contribution from the medieval philosophers, and a Protestant contribution from the reformers, who each contributing theological perspectives that collectively gave rise to modern science. In the 19th century, that begins to shift. Uh, though not entirely, but um, it, it shifts significantly with figures like Laplace, as you mentioned, uh, the physicist who said, said, or at least is rumored to have said he had no need of the God hypothesis. And then uh, 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 Darwin and, uh, and Marx, and later Freud. Um, and so you get a kind of, by the, by the early 20th century, you get a comprehensive materialistic worldview. Darwin uh, gives an account of where living things come from, without recourse to any intelligent design or guidance of any kind. And uh, so he has an, a theory of origins. Marx has a theory of the future, kind of a secular eschatology. And Freud tells us what to do about the human condition and our guilt. And so these three great materialistic uh, philosophers, scientists uh, end up answering or addressing all the main worldview questions that traditional Judeo-Christian religion had off, uh, had answered, and all in the name of science. And so by the early 20th century, you have kind of a, uh, a consolidation of a worldview known as scientific materialism, and that really has dominated the, the, the 20th century. But the argument in my book is that that's beginning to shift because of scientific discoveries that were first made in the 20th century and have continued to be reinforced by more recent discoveries right up to the present day. And that, that I call the return of the God hypothesis. So you have a kind of rise, fall, rise story if you're looking at it from a Judeo-Christian point of view. Judeo-Christian views give rise to modern science. That philosophical perspective is eclipsed in the late 19th century with the rise of scientific materialism. And now in the late 20th and early 21st century, we have the evidence coming back that supports a theistic view. And that's the, the burden of proof I bear in my book is to try to show that. Indeed. Uh, in fact, the title of your book itself is quite provocative in that sense, The Return of the God Hypothesis. Now, the usual story or the narrative that we hear today is that as more science has progressed, the scope for God as a hypothesis, uh, even to be treated as a hypothesis, that just goes down. So there's a gulf between the, the popular public perception um, that science, you know, the perception is that science leads to atheism. And I think that you also discussed this in your recent article for the Newsweek. There's that gulf between the public perception uh, about science and atheism and what the scientific data actually says. And that's what you get uh, in your book. Could you just probably speak about that gap? Well, right. Uh, we still have these very popular scientific atheists. Uh, they call themselves the new atheists. And they're 
essentially uh, celebrity scientists who have become spokesmen for atheism. And um, they argue that, uh, that science properly understood undermines belief in God. Uh, Richard Dawkins famously wrote a book titled The, the God Delusion. And his argument, I, I have always appreciated Dawkins because of the clarity with which he frames issues. I usually uh, end up on the opposite side of the issue from a good professor, but he does a great job of framing the issue. And um, he explains the, the, the basic argument of, for scientific atheism as based on Darwin's theory. He said that, that prior to Darwin, the, the most powerful reason for believing in God was the publicly accessible evidence that we have of design in nature. But he said, since Darwin's time, we've known that that evidence of design is illusory. It's evidence of apparent design, but not real design. And it's apparent design because there, he argues that there's an unguided, undirected process, namely the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection acting on random variations that produces the appearance of design in living organisms without that process having been guided or directed in any way. So you have design without a designer is the Darwinian formulation. But if there's no designer, then there's no public evidence. If there's no evidence for a designer, there's no evidence, public evidence for God. And therefore, uh, belief in God is still possible if you would like, God, Dawkins says, but it's essentially, uh, it's not based on anything. So it's essentially delu delusional. And that's his title. Um, he's also said provocatively that the universe we observe has precisely the properties that we should observe um, uh, uh, if at bottom there's no purpose, no design, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. In other words, undirected materialistic processes. I love that framing because it, it says, first of all, that the metaphysical hypothesis of materialism is testable against what we observe in the natural world. Is it the case that what we see in the natural world is exactly what we'd expect if nat uh, of naturalism or materialism were true, uh, or is it not? And I argue that it's not, that we, there are three big discoveries at least about biological and cosmological origins, about the origin of life in the universe that are precisely what we would not expect from blind pitiless indifference or from materialistic processes alone, but instead they're what we would expect if in fact there were an intelligent creator who had the attributes that, for example, Jews and Christians and other traditional theists have long ascribed to God. Uh, yeah, now just coming to the specific discoveries uh, that you highlight in your book, um, I've been noticing, in fact, preparing for this interview as well, I've been watching some of your other conversations and the kind of engagement that the book is getting as well. In fact, earlier today, I was watching your uh, exchange with Michael Shermer, and he, uh, in, in the starting part of the conversation, he says, uh, and I quote, he says, this is serious. Uh, this is, you know, it's published by, not just by Christian publishers, even publishers like HarperCollins and many of the trade or university presses are publishing works uh, like the one that we're talking about and many of your colleagues. Um, and he goes on to say that this is not your father's creationism. You are getting a, a hearing and this is being taken say, seriously. So um, coming down from the, uh, you know, uh, the old creationist arguments that that were once made, the kind of argument that you're making is a very sophisticated and pretty much backed with science. And also uh, in, in your most recent book, you make a very holistic case for design, furthering the case beyond biology to also incorporate aspects of physics and cosmology as well. So despite the insistence of methodological naturalism, uh, are all the relevant uh, sciences converging to make a unified case for design? Well, I think so. I, I would add, though, that I was um, a, 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 a little hurt by Michael's praise in that recent interview because, you know, I missed when they used to call us creationists in cheap tuxedos. That was uh, <laughs> teasing. It was it was a very good conversation. He's a very genial guy, and it was it was a. Uh, uh, a serious conversation and I and a respectful one, so I appreciated him for that. Um, I don't think he ever called us creationists in cheap tuxedos, but uh, you, you can find that on the internet. Um, that one bothered me because I paid a lot for my tux tuxedo. I don't think it was actually cheap. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, back to the subject. Um, yeah, it is holistic, but it's also a uh, is a cumulative and um, incremental case. Because my first books argued that 
for argue that there is evidence in biology of a designing intelligence of some unspecified kind. That in the digital code that we find in the DNA molecule, in the overall information storage, transmission, and processing system that we find in cells, in the molecular machinery and circuitry that we find in cells and animals, we are finding effects that we know from our experience arise from one and only one kind of cause, and that is an intelligence and mind. Um, there's a wonderful pas uh, passage I came across recently in the works of James Clark Maxwell, the great 19th century physicist. And he said, the conclusion of design follows directly from an application of the laws of thought to the, uh, the uh, phenomenon of our observation. And this is exactly the way I make the case. What we observe, we see things that we observe that we know from our experience arise from one and only one type of cause. One of the laws of thought is the idea of causal adequacy. If you wanna explain something, you have to posit a cause which is known to produce that thing, that entity. And the only kind of cause of which we know that produces digital code or complex circuitry or functionally integrated machinery is an intelligent agent. And so in biology, we, we see those types of, of effects and we do not know of adequate materialistic explanations for any of them. That's part of the burden of proof that, again, I bear in the book. And, and I think I uh, am able to bear that burden. Um, and so, but we do know of a cause that can produce, the, for example, the digital code. Uh, the, the kind the kind of information that we find in DNA, and that is intelligence. So as a result of that kind of analysis, I've concluded in my first two books that we have powerful evidence of a designing agent of some kind playing a role in the origin and history of life. Now, my readers uh, naturally wanted to know, well, what do you think about the identity of that designing intelligence? What kind of intelligence are we talking about? Are we talking about an imminent intelligence within the cosmos? AKA a space alien of some kind, or are we talking about a transcendent form of intelligence beyond the universe, uh, something like God, God or a space alien? And, it, or are we talking about perhaps a different kind of God, like a pantheistic God or something that may be a, a, a deistic God? What exactly, what, what are we, what's the best overall metaphysical explanation for the kind of evidence that we have of design in life and I would add in the universe, because that's what I did in the new book. I added in the evidence that we have from physics and cosmology about the origin and fine tuning of the universe and argued that if we bring that evidence in, then the space alien hypothesis, for example, become, quickly can be shown to be inadequate. Uh, no being within the universe could, could explain the fine tuning of the fundamental parameters of physics that are set from the very beginning of the universe and upon which that the origin and evolution of a future alien being would depend. Mm -hmm. That would get the cause uh, after the effect, which is nonsense. Similarly, no, no alien intelligence could account for the singular beginning of the universe, the origin of the universe a finite time ago, uh, because again, its its origin would uh, would come much after the beginning of the universe. It couldn't possibly be the explanation for the origin of the universe itself. So when you bring in those discover those other discoveries that the universe had a beginning, and that it has been finely tuned from the beginning, um, an imminent intelligence ceases to be an adequate explanation, but a transcendent intel intelligence becomes an even more compelling explanation. And um, and similarly, materialism which I think fails to account for the origin of the information needed to build the first life, um, can't account for the origin of the universe either because the origin of the universe, the origin of the physical universe of matter, space, time, and energy is what we're trying to explain. And before there is, uh, and before there is a physical universe, you don't have any matter that can do the, the causing, that can explain the origin of the material universe. We're trying to explain the origin of matter after all. And if, um, if matter begins at a point in time before that, there's no matter to explain its or its own origin. So I, I argue, I look, I look carefully at the competing scientific and worldview explanations that might be offered. I argue that materialism as a system of thought, not just individual materialistic explanations, but as a system of thought is fundamentally inadequate to account for the origin of the universe itself. 
Um, so that's the kind of argumentation that I engage in. I use a lot of Bayesian logic. I use a method of reasoning known as inference to the best explanation. So I use a lot of tools that come out of contemporary philosophy of science uh, to evaluate the competing hypotheses and, and come to the conclusion that, that um, a theistic designer, a designer that has the attributes of transcendence, intelligence, volition, and, um, and I would argue great power is what is necessary to account for the three great discoveries that we see, uh, the origin, the, the, the idea that the universe had a beginning, it's been finely tuned from the beginning, and there have been big infusions of information into the biosphere since the beginning. So we need a, an active, intelligent, transcendent creator to explain all three of those things. No wonder your holistic case has been getting these uh, rave reviews and, and engagements from leading experts in the field, as well as several noted public intellectuals. Jordan Peterson, for instance, took to Twitter a couple of months back, praising the book as difficult, densely informative, and well-written. He quotes a particular excerpt from the book, without functional criteria to guide a search through the vast space of possible sequences, random variation is probabilistically doomed. He followed up uh, with another tweet, another question, is this an accurate claim? Uh, he makes the case very carefully it's not often that I encountered a book that contains so much that I did not know. He seems to be very intrigued by the case for intelligent design's explanatory advantage over random mutations to explain the origin of genetic information. Uh, could you summarize the case here, what Peterson is exactly referring to, and also probably evaluate the alternate evolutionary mechanisms out there to account for the same? Right. That's... Um... Uh, a technical portion of of uh, all three books. I address this question of the um, creative power of the mutation selection mechanism with respect to the need to produce new information. Let me give a quick uh, analogy that will clarify the nature of the problem, and then maybe we'll dive a little deeper into it. Um, we now know that DNA contains information in a digital form. That it uses a four character alphabet or, co or, or set of characters to convey information. This was Francis Crick's famous sequence hypothesis in 1958. Watson and Crick elucidated the double helix structure of the molecule in 53. In 58, Crick working on his own suggests that the, the four uh, chemical subunits that run along the interior of the molecule called bases or nucleotide bases are functioning like alphabetic characters in written text or uh, like the zeros and ones in a section of software code. He, his hypothesis is eventually confirmed. Uh, it, took five, it took about seven years, seven or eight years of intense work in a period we call the molecular biological revolution. But by 1965, uh, uh, molecular biologists had elucidated what they call the gene expression system or the system for protein synthesis. And they realized that in fact, the, the sequence of bases on the DNA, on the spine of the DNA molecule, were providing information for directing the construction of proteins and protein machines inside the cell. So you had, you had digital information directing the construction of mechanical systems. Um, very similar to our modern CAD CAM technology that we use in manufacturing today. Uh, so that raised a huge question, which is where does all that information come from? And if you think about what mutation and selection do, uh, natural selection works after the fact of a successful random search for a new variation. Okay, so the creative part of the mutation selection mechanism is the random part. It's not the it's not natural selection. Natural selection is simply a sifting mechanism, but finding the new code to build a new protein has to occur first by random mutation. Now, if the number of possibilities that, uh, that need to be searched is large compared to the number of uh, possibilities which will produce a functional alternative, um, then that mechanism may be doomed probabilistically. It may not, it, it will not, there will not be enough time to search the haystack in in search for the needle. Hmm. The haystack's too big and the needle it, it, tucked away in too small a corner of it, uh, then the odds are you're gonna fail rather than succeed. And 
what has been shown mathematically by um, uh, molecular biologists who worked on this question, the, the technical name for it is the, the issue of the, the rarity of genes and proteins in sequence space. How rare are functional genes, functional sequences in relation to all the gibberish sequences? If the overwhelming majority of sequences are gibberish, then probabilistically a random search is gonna hit one of those and not find the, the, the thing you want. So here's now, here's the, the, the easy to understand analogy. If we have a, a section of computer code and we start randomly changing the zeros and ones, will we be more likely, will, will, will that computer code be more likely to degrade the function that's there and destroy it or find a new functional program or algorithm? Well, when I ask that question rhetorically to computer programmers, they, they laugh because they know that after very few changes, you, the, the code might tolerate a few random changes, but after very few, you're going to destroy any function long before you get to a new program or, or operating system. And now the same thing has been shown experimentally in the case of, of, of gene sequences. Uh, if you start to change them randomly, between three and 15 mutations are sufficient to make to to degrade the resulting protein into uh, a state of, uh, of uh, instability, thermodynamic instability. And so the, the, uh, we know empirically that the mutation selection mechanism is therefore not an effective means of generating new genetic information, not even enough genetic information to build one new functional protein. Mathematically, the reason for that is there are so many more ways to go wrong than there are to go right. And one molecular biologist who's worked on this, Douglas Axe, who did 14 years of research on this at Cambridge University, found that the ratio of the functional sequences to non-functional sequences in even a short, relatively modest length protein is one over 10 to the 77th power. So there's only 10 to the 65th uh, atoms in the Milky Way galaxy. You quickly get a sense that um, Probable a random search is going to be probabilistically doomed to find um, a non-functional sequence, not a functional one, even taking into account the four billion years of 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 of, um, uh, of, of biological history on planet Earth. The the the, the, the price, pr precise way of saying this is that it's overwhelmingly more likely that a random search, even supplemented with natural selection will fail in finding one new gene or protein in the known time of life on planet Earth than it is that such a search would succeed. So the failure is overwhelmingly more probable than success, in which case positing such a mechanism as the, as the explanation for the origin of information is overwhelmingly more likely to be false than true. And we want best explanations in science, not ones that are more likely to be false than true, certainly not overwhelmingly more likely. So I, I spell out this very careful probabilistic, it's a kind of second order probabilistic reasoning. And it's spelled out very carefully in uh, both Signature in the Cell and Darwin's Doubt, my first two books. And then I reprise that in shorter form in Return to the God Hypothesis and address various objections that have been, been um, offered and, and show those to be inadequate as well. In fact, what I, I'm able to do in the new book is cite some of this new work by an Israeli uh, protein scientist, Dan Tofik, who showed that if you start randomly changing sections of a gene, you will degrade the resulting protein within between three and 15 mutations. And that's not nearly enough to generate a whole new protein. So you're gonna degrade function long before you find new function. So bad mechanism doesn't have the creative power to generate new information. That's the bottom line. Mutation <laughs> and selection. So uh, out of curiosity, have, did you get a chance to probably discuss this with Peterson uh, himself, or uh, are you uh, aware of the we did have a short exchange on his Twitter uh, when this okay. came out because um, he asked if anyone uh, he, he he asked his followers, does Meyer is Meyer correct about this problem of of um, uh, of rarity of genes and proteins in sequence space and the difficulty of a random search. And uh, a couple of people made very facile responses saying, oh, no, 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 he's, he doesn't know anything. This is completely wrong, but didn't really uh, offer much of an explanation. So I then in 250 characters tweeted a, a, a tight summation of, of the argument. And uh, 
So, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see. I haven't had any further opportunity to, to discuss, but we were obviously encouraged since um, Jordan has such a, a following and he's such a thoughtful, such a thoughtful person. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So um, within the sphere of evolution um, of late, there is a kind of um, um, alternate set of theories that are emerging, be it extended synthesis or, uh, and such, and what do you what do you make of the theistic evolution case that is presented from uh, evolutionary paleontologists like Simon Conway Morris? Sure. Uh, well, let's start with the alternative theories of evolution that are being proposed because that's I think what's really interesting about what's going on. And Conway Morris uh, actually uh, sort of intimated that this was coming years ago. He said that uh, neo Darwinism. Um, is is effectively well. Stephen Jay Gould said it was effectively dead. Simon said we were living in a post-Darwinian world, a post-neo-Darwinian world, uh, and that is to say that it is now widely recognized among evolutionary biologists themselves that the mutation natural selection mechanism that we were talking about just a minute ago lacks the creative power to generate fundamentally new forms of life. We've analyzed that at a very deep uh, uh, molecular level applying concepts of informational analysis to the, 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 the understanding the problem. But even at a more macroscopic level, the evolutionary biologists have recognized that uh, the mutation and selection does a great job of explaining small scale variations, but it does not give an adequate account of large scale morphological innovations, fundamentally new changes in form, new anatomy, new physiology, new body plans, are not well explained by mutation and selection. So that's, that's commonly accepted among evolutionary biologists. The question then is what to do about it. And there have been a number of different new evolutionary theories or mechanisms pr pr uh, proposed either to uh, uh, complement or supplement the mutation selection mechanism or to simply replace it altogether. And in my book, Darwin's Doubt in chapters 15 and 16, I look at six or seven of these uh, new evolutionary theories or mechanisms. And in the theistic evolution book you mentioned, we take on a couple of other yet newer ones that have come down the pike. The fact that there are so many is indication of the ferment that has now beset the field. There is no dominant view because really none of these views can explain the information problem. And what I show in Darwin's Doubt is that these new views either do not address the information problem or they explain the origin of biological information by presupposing other prior unexplained sources of information, thereby simply shifting the problem out of view, but not ultimately solving it. What we know from experience is that it takes a mind to generate information. If we're talking about um, a software program. Bill Gates has said that DNA is like a software program, but much more complex than ever, any we've ever written. Richard Dawkins says uh, the DNA is like a machine code. Uh, Leroy Hood characterizes it, the great biotechnologist. He just simply calls it digital code. Well, what we know about the origin of digital code of software is that it always comes from a programmer. We know that information in a digital or alphabetic or typographic form always arises from an intelligent source, whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or information in a radio signal, information is a product of mind. And so when, the, when we have discovered as we have in the late 20th century that the fundamental entity that makes life work is not just the matter, the energy, the chemistry, it's the information, then as I've argued, we're looking at evidence for intelligent agency in the history of life. And, um, and that's, that's the problem that neo-Darwinism has been unable to solve. It turns out that the other models of evolutionary theory or other evolutionary mechanisms also fail to solve that problem. Some sweep it under the rug, some avoid it, some push it out of view, some beg the question, but none of them take it head on. And one of the reasons for that is precisely the, this extreme rarity of genes and proteins in sequence space. Um, but there are other aspects to that as well. So there's something called the waiting times problem, which is essentially an information problem. Um, and there's this problem of, of the extreme isolation 
in sequence space, the, the, the protein forms are very different from one another. The stable forms are different from an, uh, one another in their underlying sequences that make them possible. So you start to change one sequence and you degrade the form that you have long before you rise up out of the non-functional valley to a new fitness peak, as they're some, sometimes called, to a new stable form. And, and none of the evolutionary mechanisms solve that problem. Interesting. So in fact, uh, to the viewers, um, in his books, Dr. Meyer does address uh, or explain the waiting time problem and, and have several other challenges that are hotly discussed in, in the field today. Uh, moving on in the interest of time um, to the other domains of science that you interact with in the return of God, the God hypothesis. So in your previous two books, it's largely design in biology that you're dealing with. But in this book, what is fascinating is the holistic case that that it 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 puts forth. So one of the key discoveries that you cite that occasioned the return of the God hypothesis is the evidence for a cosmic beginning. Uh, however, we often hear skeptics time and again challenging the implications of Big Bang cosmology, often drawing from quantum cosmology to down downplay the um, the absolute beginning of the universe. More recently, the images. Uh, from the James Webb telescope were used by internet skeptics to have disproven the Big Bang. Uh, what do you make of such attempts and do these claims hold any evidential weight? Uh, the, the, let's dispatch with the James Webb um, um, concern right away. I have an article posted at the Daily Wired and also on my website uh, addressing the alleged claim that or the the claim alleged that the uh, alleging that the the images from the James Webb undermined the Big Bang uh, cosmology and the idea of an expanding universe. In fact, the opposite is true. And what the what's going on there is that a single researcher named Eric Lerner, who is an independent researcher, he doesn't have a PhD in physics. Uh, but he's done a lot of work advancing uh, an alternative cosmology he calls plasma cosmology. Has He's been writing skeptical things about the Big Bang since the 1990s. He had a book called The Big Bang Never Happened. And he seized on some interesting anomalies uh, in, as far as our ideas about galaxy formation. It seems that the, there were more galaxies uh, in the very, very most ancient time period of the universe that the James Webb has been able to detect than we would have expected. Now, it turns out that what he's doing is conflating ch a challenge to galaxy formation with a challenge to the expanding universe because the James Webb actually has detected the very long wavelength uh, infrared radiation that would be expected um, if the universe had expanded as much as, it as the Big Bang Theory would expect during that very long time period from the earliest part of the universe till now. Backing up, um, we, we first learned about the expanding universe because of light coming from distant galaxies that was stretched out. The scientists, the astrophysicists call that red shift. Shine light through a prism, it separates into red to violet. The red light has longer wavelengths, the violet to blue, shorter wavelengths. If an object is receding from us, then the way, way, the wavelength of light will will stretch out and will look redder than it would otherwise look in spectrographic analysis. Um, that's what was found of, of nearly all the galaxies that we observed in all quadrants of the night sky, redshift, suggesting an expanding universe outward roughly in a roughly spherical roughly spherical way. Now that's that observation is held up not only from the first observations that were made at, with Hubble's 100 inch telescope that he worked with at the Palomar Observatory in the 1920s, but with images from the, Hub the later Hubble telescope that was built in his honor and, and the Spitzer telescope. Uh, so what the James Webb is able to do is to look yet further out in space and farther back into time to look at what galaxies would have looked like in the very earliest uh, period of the universe after the Big Bang. And it has in fact found such galaxies and it has, and as best we can tell to this point, well, the light coming from those galaxies is super stretched out. It's, I, I've called it uber redshifted. It's into the infrared range. And the reason that 
this has to be the case. This is obviously the case because the James Webb telescope was built to detect such infrared radiation. That there are any galaxies of that age to talk about shows that the James Webb has detected galaxies with the kind of radiation that we would expect to be coming from such very, very distant, very old objects. It only can detect these the super old, or the, the, it's, it, it's detecting this infrared radiation and using that radiation to uh, synthesize images of very ancient galaxies. And the very fact that it's able to do that is showing us that we're getting the kind of radiation that we would expect based on the idea of an expanding universe outward from a beginning, i.e. the Big Bang Theory. Now, Lerner recognizes that, but he tries to explain that radiation away with a with a, a discredited idea known as the tired light hypothesis. And I explain in the article why that idea has been discredited. So he actually acknowledges the evidence that on its face supports expansion of the universe, but he, he, he shunts that aside and then confuses the issue of galaxy formation and the issue of evidence that would confirm an expanding universe. And what the evidence we have might challenge our theories of galaxy formation. It doesn't challenge our ideas about the, or the expansion of the universe. Great. Um, going to the second part of that question, uh, drawing a lot from quantum cosmology, let's say, uh, uh, you know, there are different interpretations of, of quantum mechanics. And some interpretations are largely used uh, by skeptics, even on the internet, to claim that the universe could have just popped out of uh, uh, popped into existence from let's say a quantum vacuum. How do you uh, respond to that? Well, this is the universe from nothing idea of uh, Lawrence Krauss or the uh, idea he popularizes the work of Alexander Vilenkin. That's one version of quantum cosmology. The other version is the Hawking Hartle uh, model of quantum cosmology. <clears throat> Hawking in his popular books claimed that he got rid of the singularity at the beginning of the universe. He had proven the singularity based on general relativity, but said, wait, maybe if we have a different theory of gravity operating when the universe is very, 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 very tiny and quantum effects need to, would need to be taken into effect, then maybe we would have a quantum theory of gravity. So he develops one, but there are a couple of curiosities about what he develops that I think actually undermine the idea that it that quantum cosmology can be used to refute a God hypothesis or a cosmological argument for the existence of God. The first is that in his technical work uh, with Hartle, Hawking doesn't get rid of the, co the, the cosmological singularity. It's presupposed in all the work. And secondly, his explanation for the origin of the universe is a purely mathematical one. He posits laws of a law of quantum gravity, or it's really a it's really not a single law. It's a kind of mathematical apparatus. It's a there's something called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which, if solved in a particular way, gives something called a universal wave function. And if the universal wave function includes a universe like ours as a possible outcome, then the quantum cosmologists will say, "Aha! We've explained the origin of the universe." So you've got these three mathematic. You've got these. You've got a big, big hairy equation, which is kind of the analog to the Schrodinger equation in in quantum physics, and as a kind of rudimentary theory of quantum gravity. Then, if the theory, if the equation can be solved to give a wave function which would um, describe a range of possible universes that could emerge, and if among those possibilities as a universe like ours, the quantum cosmologist says, says, hey, we've explained the origin of the universe from literally nothing physical. But what does explain the origin of the universe is all is this whole mathematical apparatus, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, the universal wave function, and the boundary constraints they place on the Wheeler-DeWitt equation to generate a universal wave function that will give them the answer they want. So, Alexander Vilenkin has observed has made a very provocative remark. He said, um, "He said, well, what tablet are these equations written on? These physical laws before there's matter, space, time, and energy. What could these things be describing? Um, where are they? Where do they reside? This is the realm of pure mathematics. And since mathematics." Uh, is something that's conceptual that exists in a mind are we really saying that a mind predates the universe 
and I think he's on to something very important. And Hawking himself tumbles to it. He says, what puts fire in the equations that, give them, get, that gives them a universe, that makes a universe to describe? How do mathematical equations generate an actual physical universe of matter, space, time, and energy? That's completely unexplained in quantum cosmology. Instead, it seems to have a kind of implicit a, a kind of tacit theistic implication uh, because in our experience, math doesn't cause things to happen. We use math to describe things. Hawking has also said that there is a law such as gravity explains why there is something rather than nothing or why the, how the universe came, a, a universe came into existence from nothing. Well, um, that the law is purely is is purely purely conceptual at this point. It does not laws of physics don't cause things to happen. They describe what they they don't cause matter and energy to happen. They describe what matter and energy do once they've come into existence. So I think what these uh, advocates of quantum cosmology have done is subtly support the very idea they think they're disproving, because if their theory is true, then it's pre-existing mathematics, which is conceptual and intellectual, it's it, it, they're, they're pointing to the need for a mind prior to the universe to make their whole system work. And it, there's also a technical point that to solve this big hairy equation called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, to get a uni universal wave function that will include a universe like ours, very specific, what are called boundary constraints, restrictions on degrees of mathematical freedom have to be chosen by the mathematician or the physicist to get the outcome he wants. So it's actually, what they're actually modeling is a, a teleological process where there's an input of information from a mind in order to produce a mathematical solution that will suggest that our universe is plausible or probable. And that I think, there I think they inadvertently model the need for intelligent design. This is a big, this is a complicated subject and one that takes a little more time to explain really clearly, but I think I do that in the book. So if you want a very thorough critique of quantum cosmology, um, then uh, chapters 17 and 18 in my book, take this on head on. And, but in short, what I show is that if the, if quantum cosmology, if quantum cosmological models are the correct models for the origin of the universe, they inadvertently provide support for the theistic hypothesis, uh, the, the God hypothesis. So when you talk about the absolute beginning of the universe, we are indeed talking about the beginning of all things that the scientific structure or the scientific method itself uh, would depend on. Um, so would you agree with a cosmologist like um, Marcelo Gleiser when they say that when approaching this problem, we are actually approaching the natural limits of science, the very end of science? And, and this this whole domain of the, the question of beginnings is not something that science can ultimately answer. Well, it depends on what we how we define science. If we mean by science, the ancient concept of scientia, uh, knowledge, I think we can have, uh, we can have, uh, and as philosophers, we think of knowledge as justified true belief. I think we can posit a God hypothesis and provide justification for belief in that hypothesis. Now, it might be, uh, I, I'm very happy to concede in the book that the, that the God hypothesis is a metaphysical or philosophical hypothesis, but we're you, but doesn't mean we don't know things. We, we can't know it to be true. Um, and so if we're talking about simply analyzing the material universe, we do reach a limit because the material universe itself comes into existence. And if that's your definition of science, then yes, science has come to, to a limit. But it doesn't mean that we can't think about what best explains the origin of the material universe as revealed by science. And there I think theism provides a better explanation than competing uh, worldview explanations, indeed any possible materialistic explanation, because after all, before the origin of matter, there's no matter to do the causing. So just as is the case with uh, the case for cosmic beginnings, uh, several uh, theories have been postulated also to explain the fine tuning of the universe. The most popular one is the multiverse theory. So what is your view on the multiverse, its evidential status as a rival hypothesis and implications? Well, I think this uh, the multiverse is an inadequate explanation for the fine tuning. Um, the fine tuning again is um, the idea that there are uh, there is an ensemble of separate physical parameters that 
uh, fall within very narrow ranges and have to do so in order for there to be a life conducive universe and even for there to be basic chemistry in the universe. Um, and so um, many physicists have concluded that the most commonsensical explanation for the fine tuning is a fine tuner. It looks like the universe was a setup job because there's no underlying physical or logical reason that these parameters have to be the exact, have the exact values or strengths that they have. You can't explain them by the laws of nature because it's the laws of nature themselves that are among the, the finely tuned physical parameters that we're talking about. So, um, so the idea has insistently ar arisen, as one physicist said, that we're dealing with evidence of, of a supernatural agency. Uh, Fred Hoyle, who was an atheist before he discovered some of these fine tuning parameters, said a common sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super intellect is monkeyed with physics and chemistry to make life possible. So, um, so, so that's the common sense interpretation. The, the alternate view is that, well, maybe the extreme improbability of getting all these parameters just right so that life could possibly exist in the universe is evidence that there were, were many, many, many other universes, maybe billions of other universes, so many, in fact, that eventually the correct combination of factors would have had to have arisen in one of the universes, and we just happen to be in that lucky universe. Now, the, there's a problem with that form of reasoning, and that is that if these other universes are causally separate from ours, if they're causally disconnected from ours, then <clears throat> whatever happens in those other universes has no effect on anything that happens in this universe, including whatever parameters or whatever processes that were in play or at work that set the fine tuning parameters in the first place. So simply positing other universes doesn't actually change the probabilities of uh, associated with the fine tuning parameters in this universe, unless there is some causal connection or underlying common cause that would allow the multiverse proponent to portray our universe as the lucky winner of a giant cosmic lottery. If, however, there is an underlying universe generating mechanism that's spitting out universes one after another, then we can say, well, okay, whatever is at work in that universe generating machine is affecting, is, is allowing a, us to generate a probability distribution of the different possible parameters. And so, in fact, uh, on the basis of two speculative cosmological models, modern proponents of the multiverse have advocated for two universe generating types of universe generating mechanisms, one based on string theory, one based on something called inflationary cosmology. And that's where the, the rub comes in for the multiverse proponent, because it turns out that those universe generating mechanisms themselves have to be finely tuned to produce new universes, uh, even in theory. These are highly speculative cosmological models uh, that, that allow you to think about new universes arising, but even in theory, the universe generating mechanisms must be finely tuned for the mechanism to uh, have, a, have a, a reasonable chance of generating new universes. And so the fine tuning problem doesn't go away. It's just, just pushed out of view with the multiverse. The, the, the fine tuning is explained by reference to a universe generating, generating mechanism that invokes prior unexplained fine tuning. And so in conclusion to this long answer, uh, the multiverse hypothesis doesn't provide an ultimate explanation for fine tuning. And yet we do know of a cause that does generate finely tuned systems. That cause is intelligent agency. What we mean again by fine tuning is an ensemble of parameters, of improbable parameters that work together collectively to achieve some discernible outcome or functionally significant outcome. So we could think of things in our experience that are finely tuned, internal combustion engines, or computer hardware and software working together, or a French recipe, or we could go on. But all these things have in common a single type of cause, and namely an intelligent one. And so since the fine tuning, or since the multiverse doesn't explain the ultimate origin of fine tuning, but we do have a causal explanation for fine tuning generally, intelligent design stands, I think, is the best explanation for that phenomenon. And the multiverse fails.
Now that's interesting because even cosmologists like Sabin Hosenfelder, for example, have even gone on to the extent of labeling the multiverse hypothesis as pseudoscience. Now, I find that pretty interesting because, well, the skeptics postulate the multiverse also as an explanation for the fine tuning of the universe, but also for the very existence of the universe. And on the other side, intelligent design posits God. Uh, so this has been also a common charge against intelligent design. Its critics often allege that it's a form of pseudoscience. Now, I know that this whole term pseudoscience will have to uh, you'll have to touch upon issues of the of philosophy of science like the demarcation problem but very quickly i'd like to know how do you uh, how do you see this whole uh, charge it's an attempt it's an attempt to stigmatize an idea without ever engaging the arguments for or against it and that's one of the reasons that the use of terms like pseudoscience i think is unfortunate because it doesn't it, it tends to bias a a, a, dis a discussion or a narrative before there's actual evaluation of the evidential merit for a conclusion or an inference. Um, it also trades on, as you mentioned, the demarcation problem. If you say something is not science, or if it's pseudoscience, or if it's metaphysics rather than science, that presupposes a definition of science, presupposes a, a way of defining science. And that that is actually a hotly contested issue, the issue of how to define science. And it has not been settled. And a big part of my work has been on looking at different types of scientific methods, because typically we want to say science is special because of its methods. Uh, but in fact, there are different methods of scientific reasoning and discourse. And I think the case for intelligent design um, uh, very nicely meets the criteria of a good historical scientific theory. It uses a distinctively historical scientific method of reasoning. It is testable in the same way historical scientific theories are. It's as scientific or unscientific, depending on which definition of science you want to apply, as competing Darwinian or evolutionary ideas. So the attempt to settle a, um, a, um, uh, a scientific theory by reference to definitions of science I think is is the wrong way to go. The, the The way to settle an issue is by looking at the evidence and then addressing the arguments pro and con. Uh, here's my take on all this stuff about pseudoscience and uh, metaphysics versus science. The, the The question isn't how you categorize a um, an argument or an inference or a theory or an idea. The question is whether or not the idea or theory or inference is justified by the evidence and therefore likely to be true. Uh, so I think um, the multiverse is, well, let's, let's be, I'm happy to call it a metaphysical hypothesis. I'm happy to call the God hypothesis a meta, is a metaphysical hypothesis. But that doesn't mean that we can't reason carefully about those competing hypotheses and decide which one provides a better explanation for, for example, the fine tuning evidence. Uh, both have been posited for reasons that are discernible and, 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 uh, uh, logical as explanations for the fine tuning. One provides a causally adequate explanation, the other doesn't. So I prefer, I think there are reasons to prefer the theistic design hypothesis for the fine tuning over and against the multiverse hypothesis. Um, the multiverse does not have the character of most physical theories. I grant that. So I know why Sabine is saying that. And if she wants to call it pseudoscience or metaphysics or uh, a metaphysical hypothesis masquerading as a scientific, it doesn't matter what, what you call it. How you classify an idea is kind of irrelevant. What we want to know is, do we have warrant for believing it to be true or not? Is it the best explanation, a good explanation, or an inadequate explanation? Um, I think in this case, the better explanation, the best explanation we have is theistic design. The multiverse is a poor explanation. It's inadequate. It's causally inadequate because it begs the ultimate question and never answers it. Um, it's also a, hugely in violation of Occam's razor. Um, and I go into that in, in, in depth in the book as well. So um, I, I, I appreciate Sabine's skepticism about the multiverse. I'm not myself concerned to classify things as uh, metaphysics, pseudoscience, philosophy, religion, science. I ultimately don't care about that. I think what I care yeah. about is is warrant and um, comparative explanatory power. What's the best explanation, however it be classified?
Thank you so much, Dr. Mai, for your time. And this was a fascinating conversation. Um, you know, you, your answers were very precise. And, and thank you again for your time. Thank you for being on the Carpenter's Desk. Thank you for having me on. And uh, it's great to talk to you at such a distance. Take care. Thank you.